All right, number 13 off of the 1996 practice physics GRE exam. Number 13 says a 100 watt electric heating element is placed in a pan containing one liter of water. Although the heating element is on for a long time, the water, though close to boiling, does not boil. When the heating element is removed, approximately how long will it take the water to cool by one degree Celsius? Assume that the specific heat for water is 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Our answers are 20, 40, 60, 130, and 200 seconds. Looking at the answers, I realize I cannot eliminate any of those answers. They uh, are just numerics. They all have the same um, units, so I can't eliminate anything. I'm going to have to make a calculation, and hopefully one of those answers match up to what I calculate at the end. So to do this problem, I found it helpful to imagine a picture. So I'm, I'll draw a picture, hopefully this helps you, of an electric heating element, which I don't really know what that would look like, but to me I kind of imagine it kind of like a light bulb or something. So this would be plugged into a battery or plugged into the wall or something, and then this electric heating element is plugged into our pan of water. So this is a pan of water with an electric heating element in it. Okay, so functional picture there. Now, the first thing about the problem is there's 100 watts that this electric heater can provide. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's pulling 100 watts out of the battery or the wall or whatever. Uh, it does mean that it's able to put 100 watts of energy per second excuse me, 100 joules of energy per second into the water. I don't know about you, but when I see 100 watts, immediately I don't like watts. I think joules per second. Because watts, it's just a needless unit to me. Um, so 100 joules per second, this heating element is able to move heat from the heating element into the water. 100 joules every second. Okay, it's important to understand where the energy is moving in this problem. It makes it a lot easier for me anyways. So 100 joules per second is going into the water from the heating element. The other bit about this problem that can confuse people has to do with the wording. The heating element is on for a long time. That's actually code word for the system is going to be in a thermal equilibrium state. Moving on, the water, it's close to boiling, it does not boil. And that's kind of a code word as well, meaning that whatever temperature it's at, it is just about to boil. And that's a little nuance of the problem that's kind of cool. This doesn't necessarily mean we are at 100 degrees Celsius. Water does in fact boil at 100 degrees Celsius under standard conditions. We don't know anything about the conditions here. We don't know the temperature of the outside environment. We don't know the pressure on the water or anything like that. We know that this water is at a temperature that it is just about to boil. If we continued adding more energy into this beyond this 100 joules per second that the, the heating element is providing, the water would boil if we could add more energy. That's what we know and that's what I want you to keep in mind. So don't get bogged down with the details, but we don't know the pressure. Realize that we don't know the pressure. This is not necessarily standard conditions, um, but we can still solve the problem. So when the heating element is removed, okay, before, before I get to that, we're going to pull this out and we're going to stop this. The other important bit to solve this problem has to do with why this water does not boil. This says it's on for a long time. It's gone to th thermal equilibrium. We could leave this in for an entire day or a week or whatever. How can this water not boil if you're continually pumping 100 joules per second of energy, thermal energy, heat, into this water? Why does it not boil? Hopefully you've thought about that for just a brief second and you know why it's not boiling. If there's 100 joules per second going in to keep it at this temperature, but it's not boiling, then there's got to be 100 joules per second going out. And so what's happening is this water, this pan of water, is also losing 100 joules a second to the environment. That is why the water is not boiling. So all of these little new squigglies that I've drawn in here collectively 
would represent 100 joules per second of heat energy being transferred from the pan and the liquid to the environment. It heats up the air around it, it heats up the ground, whatever. Um, the environment outside of this pan of water is absorbing that same 100 joules per second. That's why you're able to maintain this for a long time without the water boiling. By the way, do you remember when uh, something does boil, when it moves through a phase change, it does stay at the same temperature. If this water, if we added any more to this, if we added 101 joules per second, it would start to boil um, and it would be steam at that same temperature, at that same temperature of the boiling point coming off. But the, the temperature would no longer continue to rise as it does when it's cooler. You, you, the liquid rises up through its temperature until it's, it's its boiling point. And then it stays at that temperature, but it undergoes the phase change and would change in this case from a liquid to steam to a gas. All right. So we've got 100 joules per second coming in to the water through the heating element and 100 joules per second going out to the environment. That's the key to solving this problem is realizing how the the rate at which this water is transferring heat energy to the environment. Because what we're going to do next is we're going to remove the heating element. So we pull this out. We are no longer, or just turn it off, if you will. We are no longer providing this 100 joules per second into the water. Is this still happening? What is the temperature outside? We said we don't know. But we do know the temperature is lower outside than the temperature of the water because we would not be able to transfer 100 joules per second of heat energy out this way to the environment if this temperature was not lower. So we know the temperature is lower out here. Are we going to be able to transfer the same 100 joules per second after we turn off the heater? And hopefully you, you should realize that, yeah, why not? Why wouldn't we be able to make that same transfer of energy? We pull the heater out, and this is going to be the same. As the temperature of the water changes, we will not be able to sustain this because this will go down. And if you recall, the rate at which you can transfer heat energy from, from, one, uh, from one environment to another is dependent on the difference between the, the temperatures of those two environments. So as the water... Uh, as the temperature of the water goes down, we will not have as high a uh, rate of heat transfer. We will not have this whole 100 joules per second, even after one degree of Celsius. At the end, we will not be able to manage this 100 joules per second. But this is a good approximation to say that over this one degree, the first degree of heat we lose, we will be able to, to channel off 100 joules every second of heat energy. So how do we get to this answer? How do we get to the amount of time it's going to take us to move through this one degree Celsius? And it's a little tricky as well. You use the specific heat. The specific heat tells us something. It says if we have one kilogram of water, because this is for water, every degree of temperature that we change, whether we're increasing or decreasing, we trade off, that's 4.2 joules of energy. So if we want to go down one degree Celsius, we have to shed off the 4.2 kilojoules of energy to go down. If we want to raise the temperature, we have to dump in 4.2 kilojoules to one kilogram, and we can raise it for one degree Celsius. So that's just the definition of what uh, this specific heat uh, is the way that I see it. So we want to go down this one degree Celsius we are going to have to do 4.2 kilojoules. And I don't like 4.2 kilojoules in my head. It's already converted into 4,200 joules. And so we're going to have to drop 4,200 joules of energy. And we need to make sure this matches. That's the other part for kilogram. And we don't have a kilogram of water. We have a liter of water. Are those two things the same? If you remember some of your chemistry, you may remember that they are, in fact, the same. Not for any liquid. Don't make it too simple. If you happen to have one liter of water, you are approximately at one kilogram of water. That just happens to be 
the density of water. So this is very convenient and they've obviously set that in as one more little shortcut. So if you like, you can also just imagine this as one kilogram of water instead of one liter of water. So we've got a kilogram of water. We need to we need to shed 4,200 joules of energy if we want to change the temperature by one degree. How long will it take? We can shed 100 joules per second. So you can probably see there that we need 42 seconds. We need 42 seconds at this rate. If we multiply this number by 42, we get our 4,200 joules which allows us to drop one degree Celsius. So this is our answer is 42 seconds. Of course, we do have to approximate. They're not going to give us the luxury of having the exact answer there, but we found it. The answer is 40 seconds, answer B. And so hopefully we can accept that answer with some measure of confidence. One other point that I wanted to make about this problem, I would say this is a very good, if you have not memorized this before now. This is the one. I'm sorry, that was a really bad uh, box there I made. I actually can make straight lines. Um, see? This is a good one to memorize. One liter of water is about one kilogram of water. I wouldn't uh, be surprised if that was on other physics GRE problems. What you, this is, this is a, uh, Something I saw come up in uh, another solution to this problem. Somebody had made a mistake in their solution, actually. And they had uh, said that one liter equals one cubic meter, which equals one kilogram. And they were saying of water. So this would have had a subscript of water on it. And this is a no-no right here. I guess that's a common mistake if people that are doing physics GRE problems are making it, but one liter is definitely not one cubic meter. And intuition should tell you that. If you know what a, a two liter bottle of soda looks like, uh, you know that's a lot different to a cubic meter of volume. And so one liter is actually, I think it's a deciliter, one tenth, or excuse me, a decimeter cubed. So a tenth of a meter cubed is one liter. And that's confusing because it's a liter. You would think it would correspond to this, but it does not. Keep that in mind. One liter does not equal one cubic meter, and don't make that particular mistake. So hopefully uh, this has uh, been helpful to you. I enjoyed this problem. It's kind of a nice oh, thermal problem, but it's also an energy problem.